Okay, so thanks everyone who's joined the call. Uh, when I was chatting to Rob about some of the potential topics we should cover for this, one of the, the ones that we, uh, we came up with was talking about some of the changes with Windows Server 2012 R2, especially in terms of not all of the features, all of the new things that it supports, but really focusing on some of the, I guess, the cloud enablement pieces in it or the cloud integration uh, components that are included with uh, Windows Server 2012 R2, because there are some fairly major changes versus what Windows Server uh, has offered in the past. So with these, the, um, just gonna wait for the slide to progress. So with the introduction of the Server 2012 R2 Essentials product, it's still focusing on three of the same key pillars that you had with the, the previous edition, which was really around that data protection. So client and PC, uh, client and server backup, for example, uh, looking at things such as how do you make it easy for people to get back inside the network uh, without making it too complicated. But then that final piece, which is that integrating the additional cloud services. And this is something where the big improvement this time around has been around the Windows Server Essentials features that were really only available in the Essentials product. So you could install them in Essentials, uh, but you, you couldn't install them in Standard. You'd have to do an essential, Essentials installation, then do an in-place upgrade to Standard, which was, you know, it wasn't the hardest process in the world, but you don't necessarily want to be doing that kind of thing with what ends up being a production operating environment. So this time around, these cloud integration services, as well as the other Essentials features, and now effectively roles inside of Windows Server 2012 R2. And I'll walk you through this so you can get an idea of just how, how easy it is to turn a, an installation of Server 2012 R2 uh, into a full, basically a, a, a completely expanded version of uh, the Essentials product. So just to go through a couple of things here, even though the cloud piece is what I'm going to focus on, there are a few other elements that I'll talk about from each of those, from the, from the protect your data and provide secure and remote access side, just so that you've got an idea of some of those features so that I'm not skipping over them altogether. So on the business continuity side, one of the important things here is, is that you've got the ability now to start running essentials inside of a VM as a supported, uh, as a supported capability. So you can run uh, essentials, so during the Essentials installation, it gives you a choice of installing to bare metal or installing Hyper-V first and then running it in a, in a VM. And if you choose the option to start running it inside of a VM, it means you can take advantage of the Hyper-V replica feature. Now, when you take a look at this, it's talking about the, the concept of a replica site. So a replica site could be a branch office. It could be another building in the same city, or it could even be you going through and having this uh, replicated out to a, a hosting provider, for example. And the idea here is, is that you've got uh, you know, background processes, so every 10 to 15 minutes or so, you'll have updated data from running VMs pushed through to this remote server or remote location. And this traffic, you can secure it so that it's going across uh, HTTPS, so in terms of what you need to configure on firewalls, etc., it's fairly simple. But what you do need to make sure, though, is, is that if you are pushing this out, not just as a backup option, but also from something that you want to switch over to running in a live environment, so effectively you've got a failover solution, you need to put a little bit more of an investment into how you configure the networking to make sure that if the main server is offline, that the or sorry, the main VM is offline, that you can actually then you know relocate that other uh, VM quite quickly. But this is all very, very well documented because some of these capabilities were in Server 2012, um, and this is really just making it easier by exposing it through uh, 2012 R2 and Essentials in an easier uh, manner. So as we take a look at the, the second piece, which is the providing secure remote access, how do you empower the remote user? So this is really all about continuing to give end users the ability just to use the tools that they, they need. So whether they need to get remote file access, whether they need to get remote desktop access into their machine in the office. If they've got Windows Phone devices uh, or Windows 8 or 8.1, Microsoft's got apps for those platforms. So this is really a matter of continuing on that legacy that Microsoft's had of making it easy for you to get back into these, uh, into these platforms. And in this case, as you can see, Microsoft is very deliberately pushing you towards eight, you know, Windows 8, Windows 8.1, as well as Windows Phone 8 for 
for, as the preferred platform for these tools. So it's not something where they're going out and making a lot of noise about supporting other platforms. Instead, the approach there is, is well, can't you use a web browser uh, on their own platforms? They are saying, let's, you know, let's just focus on uh, doing a good job with the latest versions rather than having to go too far back. Now, as we move on to the email integration piece, this is something that I think anyone who's already worked with Essentials uh, 2012 has already started seeing, that you've got the ability to go through and get your Office 365 integration. You've got the ability to deploy an on-prem exchange server and keep working with that. But one of the other pieces that's also here is the ability to support hosted exchange. Now, the ability to support hosted exchange is a framework that's provided to hosters. So hosters are the ones who actually need to build these components. So that's just one of the things where you've you know, taking into account all of the different variations and the different ways that hosters could have their Exchange environment set up, so all the different versions of Exchange, how they're publishing, etc. This is something where the onus is on the hosting providers to actually fill this gap. It's not something that is in box with the product. And these are things that allow you to go through and do some you know, pretty cool stuff in terms of seeing how much disk space, or sorry, how much of the storage space users are using, etc. Uh, so it's not just a matter of being able to set up the account and doing synchronization. It's really starting to give you a lot more insight into that. However, and I know this isn't going to come as a surprise to you, when you're using the Office 365 integration capabilities, all of a sudden there's a lot of additional functional functionality that does start lighting up in these uh, integration modules. So the ability for you to go through and manage your SharePoint online libraries, so you being able to really go through and get an idea of you know, how much storage space is available, etc., inside of these, as well as starting to give you that uh, direct access into Exchange ActiveSync. So for mobile device management, if you want to look at the devices that have been uh, connected, if you want to start implementing things like password policies, if you want to start getting a bit more restrictive around uh, you know, what types of devices, etc., can connect, then these are things that you can get uh, now through the console as well. Now, just on the final piece here, which is the remote wiper mobile device, it's important to note here that this is not a selective wipe. Uh, this is not something you would do to someone's personal device unless they gave you explicit permission to do so. Uh, Microsoft does have solutions around selective wipe uh, in the uh, in the System Center and Windows Intune family, but just in terms of what's included here with uh, with Office 365, that's not something that it does actually provide natively. Okay. Now, another piece here is the Windows is your backup integration. And at this point, I haven't seen any announcements around what the situation is in Australia in terms of uh, what's actually be going on with this. But this is where Microsoft is really starting to do a much better job of leveraging all of the different uh, services that they are starting to offer online. So you being able to use Windows as your storage as a, as a location for you to be able, be able to start backing up uh, the types of files that you want to be pushed to the cloud as you know, just set, set it and forget it uh, off-site data protection. So in this case, if you've already got Office 365 set up, then you can start looking at, well, can you, can you start using the same user accounts, etc. There are some things that you have to think about in this case, which is if you're going through a syndication partner, uh, this is something that you need to think that you will actually need to go through and set up a different account to do this because you can't join additional services uh, unless that syndication partner also offers them. So that's just one of the little gotchas that you've got with the is your backup integration. But once more details of this come through in terms of, uh, you know, because it's still not a, re a released product, uh, hopefully we'll get a bit more detail over the coming weeks. Maybe uh, at the upcoming Partner Summit, Microsoft will share a few more of those details because I know that uh, Server 2012 R2 is going to be uh, featured heavily in some of the sessions there. Now, I've mentioned that you do have a couple of different deployment options now. So you can continue to deploy Windows Server Essentials the way that you did with the 2012 product, which is you just deploy it on bare metal and it runs. But the two new options that you've got here is implementing as a role, so with standard or even with data center. So it seems a little bit strange to be saying that you can add these roles to uh, a license for data center, for example, but sometimes people may just be looking at the client setups, at the client backup and recovery side and saying, you know, we've got a handful of people for who this is going to be fantastic. You know, you don't necessarily need to roll it out to everyone in your organization. 
but you can pick and choose the different options that you want to, uh, to deploy to different groups of users. And in general, Microsoft recommends it for these types of additional services that you're adding in from, the, from essentials into standard and data center. They normally make the recommendation of sticking to about a maximum of, of 100 users. Uh, the reason being is that is all they've tested to. So they don't hard block it at 100, but they say that once you're outside of 100, you're entering unsupported territory. So it's just one of the things to think about uh, if you are looking at you know, some simple client-side backup options, etc. For someone who's bigger than 25 users, this is going to give you that. Now, the second option around implementing is a virtual machine. So this is you know, a really nice option where all, you, all you're doing during this setup is telling it that you want to run it on top of Hyper-V and it will do the rest of the job for you. So for this, per for this one though, you just need to make sure that the hardware you've got is capable of running Hyper-V which in general, if the hardware is capable of running uh, Windows Server Essentials, the chances are it is going to be able to run Hyper-V as well. But you just need to make sure that, uh, that you do have all of the virtualization support enabled before you go through that process, otherwise it won't work. Now, as we take a look at some of the different deployment scenarios that Microsoft will be promoting around this, uh, yeah, some of these just haven't changed that much over the years from uh, whether it was SBS messaging or foundation server messaging. Yeah, so starting off with having it as a replacement or a, a, the first server in a peer-to-peer -peer environment, Microsoft still expects Essentials to be primarily a, an OEM play, so they don't expect to sell a lot of it through other channels. But uh, just like the previous version, it is something that you can also license through things like Spla, et cetera, as well. So that if you do want, if you are a hoster and you're looking at some of these things, it's, you know, it can provide some additional capabilities versus what just a um, you know, standard Windows server may have been able to provide in the past. And you know, where would you use it when you have to run your own line of business apps and you know, combining it with things like your you know, Exchange Online or whether you want to use Hosted Exchange. And it's really a matter of, with Essentials now, I guess probably the strongest message that's coming out now is, is that because these features have been rolled into the core Windows products as well, for me that was really a good sign in terms of the, the longer life cycle that the product was going to have. Because if you think about products that are sort of sitting on the edge and not quite mainstream products, uh, I think we're all at the point now where we have to be a lot more, you know, a lot more cautious about getting too closely aligned to a product that may not survive the next round of product updates, for example. So in this case, the incorporation of these essential capabilities into Windows Server itself, to me, is really a, a good indication that the, the work the team is doing there is valued and will continue to move forward. Okay. Now, with the virtualized deployment, you only need a single license for this, and it will install Hyper-V on the host, and then Windows Server Essentials runs as the guest on top of that. And the good thing here is, is that uh, you know, once you do this, as I mentioned, you can start running Hyper-V Replica. So if you wanted to, if you wanted to send you know, updates to another running server in the same location or in a remote location, you can do that. Uh, just be aware, though, that this isn't what you know, it's not a replacement for clustering. This is more of a, a disaster recovery option more than a, a high availability option. Whereas if you think about the requirements, if you want to do virtual machine clustering, the important one of the important things there is is that you do need to have some kind of shared storage system, so that uh, if one server goes offline, the other one can pick up the slack. Or if you want to do things such as uh, live migrations, etc., that they can you know pretty much occur just with memory transitions, uh, because the you know trying to do a whole lot of disk activity doesn't really make it that much of a you know a real time migration. And because the uh, with the Hyper-V replica, it's not something that it's doing in real real time. There's always going to be a little bit of lag between what what has changed and what appears on the new system. It's it's not something that's really suited to failover because the clients won't be able to get back to the same point in time to what the server is actually doing. So just be wary of that. Is that it's you know, it's more of a, a product if you think about it from the perspective of a natural disaster hitting uh, your location. So if we, you know, we can use Brisbane as an example because we all are familiar with the flooding that went on there. This gives the ability to go through and have that, you know, that virtual machine replicated pretty much anywhere where you've got an agreement with someone or even your own company to get that, that copy across. So even if you've lost 10 or 15 minutes of work or data, that's still a lot better than, uh, than pretty much being out of action altogether. 
Now what I'll do here is instead of talking about the Windows Server Essentials experience, I'll switch across and start sharing uh, my screen so that you can see this process, uh, just so that we're not sitting in PowerPoint for the, for the whole session. And I'll just keep an eye on my screen to see when it starts appearing. So the way that you go through and configure this is you just use uh, Server Manager in Windows Server 2012 R2. So those of you who've already been using Windows Server 2012, good news is, is that uh, Server Manager really hasn't changed very much. So any investment you've made to learning the UI still carries forward. So all I have to do is click on Add Roles and Features, and I'll just do a few nexts. I've only got one server running in this environment, so I can just choose that server. Realistically, I'll want to change that server name later, but we can do that later. Now, as I go through here, we'll see down the bottom that we've got the Windows Server Essentials Experience, or WSEE, -E. so it's a bit of a mouthful. So what's important to take a look at here is that there is a really large number of additional services uh, and components that are required in order to get this running. And I won't go through all of them, but a few of them are important ones to call out. So first of all, uh, the ability for it to go through, it will install branch cache automatically for you. So you start getting uh, optimization of certain types of network traffic uh, down on your, uh, your local network. Other things, so the remote server admin tools get installed, a lot of IIS pieces get installed because the remote web access requires a lot of those. And you know, as you can see here, the other option that's added down the bottom is Windows Server Backup because it just uses Windows Server Backup uh, for the server backup. It's not going through and doing its own you know, rewritten uh, server backup engine, it's just going through and using that. So now if I just click on Add and we level of this run, There's one other th important thing here is, is that you'll see here is that Windows Server Essentials is only supported for single domain environments, which uh, I think you know I think we sort of we are used to that kind of uh, requirement. Now, if we take a look at the role services, we'll see that there's you know quite a few different web server roles uh, that are required if we need to make any changes. If we know that we're going to be setting up a line of business app that requires some additional IIS capabilities, we can go through and do all of that pretty simply uh, once we're in here. Then once that's done. You know, we can choose the option to restart the destination server if required, uh, but in this case we don't need to. I'll just let it go through and do the rest for us. So you can see here that it's you know it's going to take a few minutes for it to go through and install all of those those components. But now once it goes through and install these installs these components, it's a little bit of a different process to when you're setting up the um, when you're setting up Windows Server Essentials it pretty much will launch into a wizard during an early part of setup for you to be able to support, supply your domain name details, username, etc. Whereas in this case, you can actually do a lot more with the operating system before you, uh, before you get to that point. So if there's additional configuration that you want to do here, even if you think back to some of the older versions of SBS where, you, where you know, over time you'd learn to sort of cancel out of the wizard before it progressed, so you could do any tweaks, maybe adding extra drivers if you had to configure a second network adapter. You've got those kinds of capabilities again in here. So it's very easy for you to, to make those changes uh, prior to the rest of the OS installation. So now that that's completed, uh, if you are familiar with Server Manager, uh, this will be a bit of a refresher for you. But if you're not familiar with Server Manager, uh, hopefully you'll pick up a few things here. So a couple of things happened when, we, uh, when that wizard got to completion. So First of all, here it told us that we need to configure Windows Server Essentials. What this effectively does is we'll launch what we'd normally see if we're setting up Windows Server Essentials on its own. Because in this case, it's seen that the machine that I've got, it's not a domain controller. It's not joined to a domain. So it says, hey, you need to be the DC, end of discussion, and it wants to kick things off from there. So if this was a machine that was already joined to a domain, it wouldn't necessarily, it wouldn't prompt you to become a domain controller because it sees that you've already got a domain controller in that environment. Now, if I just go up here, you'll see that we've got that same information being presented up here in our task list. So it's telling us that we, you know, we do need to configure Windows Server Essentials. So you know, if I just click on that, we can see what's, what's next. I'll close this. And I won't go through this Configure Windows Server Essentials uh, completely because it's really not changing. Like, but most of the things that you're going through here are things that you've already seen if you have run with Windows Server in the past. So 
things of the matter. If it tells you it might take a while, uh, the company information where it will generate the domain name from that. So from there, it's just taking you from, so what you're seeing here, it's taking you from standard Windows Server 2012 R2, and we just added this as, as a role. So you can see that instantly there's a lot more flexibility in terms of different types of deployment scenarios. And uh, you know, if this, as I mentioned, if this machine was already uh, joined to a domain, it doesn't go through these, this, uh, this configuration step because it, it doesn't need to. Okay. So I'll just jump back to the presentation and actually I might just kick this off in the background and let it run and we'll see how we go from a time perspective to see how it, how it proceeds. And I'll just hide the pre. I'll stop sharing that. I'll go back to the presentation. And just a quick question. Quick question, Mark. Yep. Um, is this the Essentials product limited to twenty-five users or something? Is there a, a limitation on the users? Yeah. So Essentials is limited to twenty-five. But if you, but then when you go to the, you can do. So with twenty twelve. So we'll start with that. You can do an in-place upgrade of twenty twelve Essentials by installing standard or data center over the top. Um, and that breaks those limits, but it introduces that you do need to buy the, obviously a Windows Server 2012 license and the appropriate cows. Um, so in this case, if you, if you need to go above 25 users, you don't need to do that initial install and then do an in-place upgrade. Instead with R2, you just uh, install it. Then you say you want to add the 2012 R2, uh, essentials capabilities and it then uh, will do this automated installation for you. So basically you could take a server that's got more than 25 cows and add the Essentials experience on top and still get the more than 25 users, is that correct? Uh, yeah, yeah, so now, yeah, so with, the, so with this one, what they, so they'll officially support up to 100 users on those features. Um, and the, they've just got a number in place because if you start thinking about things like the client backup, for example, uh, if you think about the kinds of network traffic and disk traffic that trying to back up too many clients to a machine that's not really up to spec in terms of its disk subsystem, so they just need to put some limitations in place there. And the chances are that you can exceed those without really seeing any ill effects. The problem is, is if you do see any ill effects, Microsoft can't really give you any advice except go back to 100 users. But you can have more than 100 users in AD, for example, it's just a matter of uh, those those roles themselves. Okay. Okay, so I just gave you a quick look at that. So you can see here that it, it does a lot of that, uh, you know, it, it goes through and it automates a lot of that process for you. And uh, if you are familiar with Server Manager, you'll know that it's all, all of the stuff that's going on here is being driven by PowerShell scripts. So you can go through and you know, automate this even further completely through PowerShell if you don't want to go through the, the GUI at all. Now, I've, I've already spoken a little bit about the deployment using virtualization. Um, so some of the options here is that if you start looking at Windows Server 2012 standard and data center, the ability to run virt multiple virtual machines with each of those, then you know, that means that if you want to run, you know, the DC with some of these uh, Windows Server Essentials features enabled, you can do that and then keep your second uh, license for running things like your line of business apps, for example. So as much as a lot of the push here is around the cloud integration pieces, it's unfair to think of this only as a, you know, as a cloud-based solution because a lot of the on-prem capabilities it gives you are, are pretty, you know, pretty damn good as well. Even though we, you know, we, we're not spending a lot of time on the on-prem on side, it's a matter of uh, you know, that stuff is covered. Now, Rob, this addresses that question you just had, which is how do you grow beyond 25 user accounts? So, yeah, so probably the, the most important thing here is, is that, you know, it's talking about maximum supportability of 100 users and devices. So it's not saying you can't go above that, but it's just a matter of, you you know you don't necessarily want to be relying on something in a large organization that the you know you don't want to be using something that the vendor isn't willing to support that's not sending a good signal whatsoever so the three main areas that we went through and i've got a, a couple of slides after this one uh just to uh, give a bit a few more details in terms of some of the differences so 
even though I covered the first two, the protect your data and the provide for secure remote access pretty quickly, uh, you know, it's that focus on the, the cloud service integration that is really where, you know, if you think about the first version of uh, Essentials that was introduced, it was it didn't have the Office 365 integration components included, uh, but it was something that component was released uh, like a couple of months after the main product came out. So this is something where it's good to see that the, this team is really forward thinking in terms of how do we integrate with what Microsoft's doing, how do we build a framework for letting other people plug into this so that it's not just um, Office 365, because Microsoft knows that you know, as much as they want to be out there promoting Office 365, that it's, you know, there are some customers who, for whatever reason, uh, can't or won't go down that path. So this means that having this extensible framework yeah, it makes it easy for other people to start plugging in. But of course, there has to be enough demand for those plugins to be written uh, for, you know, for, uh, otherwise, you know, Microsoft's not going to be, uh, be writing them themselves. Now, for the, the product links, there's already a bunch of information up on, a whole whole lot of information up on tech, TechNet. Uh, the product page is already live up on Microsoft.com. So what I'll do is I'll just jump to the next slide because this is where it gives a better, a better idea of some of the things that have changed here. And what this is starting to highlight is not just things that are necessarily going to be exposed by the essentials components, but there are also a few additional things in here around trying to get a bit more exposure around what you can start doing now with uh, Server 2012 R2. So what are some of the enhanced capabilities here? So things like the auto VPN uh, capabilities, uh, the ability to, even though it's a little bit out of the SMB side, um, you know, much better uh, system center options. Uh, even storage spaces are things that it will go through and start doing a better job of setting up for you. File history options are set up automatically. So. Some of these things are things that I deliberately cut out of the, the full deck just because it's, you know, otherwise it would turn it into a two hour session. But this just gives you an idea though that overall there are quite a few new features in Server 2012 R2 and quite a few of them, uh, you know, can be used natively in Essentials or when you start adding the Essentials roles. So all up, another pretty big server update from Microsoft this time around. And it, it, yeah, it should be available from DISTI's uh, on October 18 or 19 in Australia. Cool. So that's that's it for me, Rob. So um, I guess if we've got any any questions there. All right. Well, while we're uh, again, if you've got any questions for Mark, type them into the uh, the chat window in the, the bottom left um, over there, and I'll I'll relay them if, if Mark can't see them. Um, oh yeah, yep, I've got, I've got them up here. Yeah. Yeah, if there's anybody questions. The interesting thing I found was that, for example, um, I saw that SharePoint um, is not supported on 2012 R2 as yet. Uh, those kinds of things always happen. Yeah. Yeah, it's like I'd, I'd never make much fuss out of something not being supported at RTM. Um, six months after RTM, I'd be making a lot of fuss over it. But if you look at it from the, the deployment lifecycle, someone who was planning on deploying SharePoint and were doing it soon would have done all their testing on a previous version of Windows Server. They wouldn't be going out and, you know, doing, you know, planning on deploying it on the brand new OS just because it's what Microsoft released. So, yeah, so similar things happen with you know, SharePoint, sorry, with, uh, you know, with Exchange and Windows Server with different versions where sometimes it takes a while for them to get, to get synchronized. But in terms of the the real impact in production environments, it's a lot smaller than what the internet would have you think. Yeah. Um, any any ideas on pricing? Have you got any indication on the pricing? I try not to pay any attention to things like that. <laughs> I do I, that and licensing. I avoid like the plague, so that I can honestly say I have no idea. Fair enough. Um, there's a question there from Phil Haddock about the release date. Uh, so 18th of October. So it's already RTM. If you've got uh, your got an MSDN subscription, you can grab it now. Um, and the, yeah, the version I'm using is RTM code from from an MSDN. So it's just a matter of DISTIs should have it on their price list uh, very very shortly because uh, yeah, they should be able to start selling it on October 18. Cool. Uh, 